When it comes to the Dreamcast, many of its better games have seen ports to other systems in the years since its demise. This means they get to live on so that future generations have a chance to play some of these unforgettable titles. Unfortunately, there are still some games locked to the platform, and the only way to play them is on original hardware or emulation of it. In this episode, we will be looking at some console exclusives for the Dreamcast. These games range in quality from absolutely brilliant to just okay, but they all are interesting enough to fire up and give a few minutes of your time to. This isn't meant to cover every Dreamcast console exclusive. These are just the ones I felt like talking about right now. I tried to give a decent mix of genres, so hopefully you'll find something here to enjoy. No Dreamcast exclusive list would be worth making if it didn't include Project Justice. Released in 2000 as a Naomi arcade game, it made its way home soon thereafter. It's a sequel to the PlayStation classic Rival Schools, and it again is set in Japan as high school students and their families are embroiled in a ruthless plot to upend society. The tag team based gameplay here is addictive and loaded with great combos particularly the team-up moves that correspond with each student's specialty. Everything has that crazy over-the-top Japanese feel to it, which gives it all of its personality and charm. Visually, it's nothing short of impressive even now thanks to the great character models, awesome animation and special effects, and overall art design. Say what you want about the story, but when it comes to gameplay and presentation, this is one series that desperately needs to be brought back. The original D was one of the pioneers of the horror genre in video games. So when D2 showed up on the Dreamcast in 2000, I was immediately curious to see what Warp and Kenji Ino had in mind for the new generation. While I appreciated the attempt, I have to admit that this game has a ton of problems. If you've played the first, what you get here is actually quite a bit different. Gone is the slow and plodding full motion video interface of the first. And now we have a fully polygonal engine that allows you to free roam much of the game. You still get some on rail segments, but these are mainly just while looking for items in small rooms and such. Also new is the introduction of random battle events that pop up while you are running around. These take place in the first person view and have our hero Laura defending herself with various weapons and being able to change her viewpoint to accommodate the direction of the threat. You receive experience from these battles that increase stats like your hit points, which are crucial to your survival. This lends the game an RPG feel that is usually entirely absent from the genre. In fact, this game is a mix of a number of genres. It's almost as if someone took Resident Evil, the original D, and added in a dash of Final Fantasy and Metal Gear Solid. The problem is, is that it does none of these things particularly well. While you have to commend the attempt, focusing on a single engine and mastering that would have been preferable. As it stands, you get a game with odd pacing, frustrating controls, and almost no scary moments past fumbling with the controls. It's worth playing just because it's so unique, but this could have been so much better with a little more focus on the things it actually does well. <gasps> Believe it or not, Sega Rally 2 remains a console exclusive to the Dreamcast. Originally a Model 3 arcade game, the only other port this game has seen was to Windows PCs in 1999. 
the Dreamcast port was done using Windows CE, which is just a fancy way of saying that the PC game was moved over in its very unoptimized state. This means very uneven performance that sees the frame rate constantly in flux. The thing is, the fundamental strength of the arcade original is still here. The gameplay still has a great physics engine behind it, and the cars all have varying stats that give each a personality all their own. The tracks have great variety and the visuals are solid overall. The core of this game is still incredibly solid. The problem of course is, is that the up and down performance is going to ruin it for a great many people. If you are the type that puts an emphasis on a rock solid 30 or 60 frames per second in your games, you'll likely turn your nose up to it and never return. My love for Sega Rally is so strong, I still play this from time to time and continue to hope that Sega someday ports the Model 3 original to a modern system. It's been far too long since this game was released. I avoided Max Steel here for a very long time. I saw the opinions of it back when it was released and decided I didn't need to play such a low quality title. Some years later I sat down and gave it a go, and while Max Steel won't be on any top 10 lists, or hell top 50 for that matter, I came away enjoying this stinker a lot more than I ever thought I would. Max Steel is actually based on the action figure and TV series of the same name. As Max Steel, you use your powers to try and stop an evil organization from doing some rotten things in the world. Your job is pretty simple, infiltrate and kick everyone's ass. You can punch and kick, you can throw grenades, you can shoot with a few different types of weapons, and you can also go all superhuman on everybody and use things like super speed and stealth camo. The gameplay is a mix of sneaking around and run and gun action, and while there is no question there is a low budget feel to the experience, there is also a bit of fun here as well. Each area you get dropped into has the usual prerequisites to accomplish. Buttons need to be pushed, switches switched, and crates moved around. In fact, it feels kind of like the developer Treyarch lifted quite a bit from GoldenEye for the Nintendo 64 in making up its content. And you heard that right, Treyarch developer of many a Call of Duty game actually created this. Go into it with the proper mindset and I guarantee you'll find some enjoyment in it. It's clunky, it's not that great looking, and the story is pure cheese, but there is an irresistible charm here that I just love. For a long time I have heard people claim that Ill Bleed on the Dreamcast is this revolutionary game that goes well above and beyond your normal survival horror experience. I can't argue there because this is definitely a unique game. The story has you going to an amusement park that was visited a few days before by your friends, who have since disappeared without a trace. Supposedly, if you can figure out the puzzles it presents you, you win a hundred million dollars. The problem is, those that go in don't come out. Your job is to use your senses like sight, hearing, and smell to keep calm and figure out just what the hell is going on. If you get too scared or hurt, the game ends with your death. You will need to use your powers of perception and reasoning to piece together your next move and ultimately, the mystery you are faced with. You can unlock additional characters as well. The gameplay takes some serious getting used to and I highly advise reading the beginning of a walkthrough the first time you play it to understand what you have to do. The random battles and fear system can be utterly baffling to newcomers. Illbleed was developed just for the Dreamcast and only released in Japan and North America in 2001.
In 1999, Cool Borders got a sequel on the Dreamcast called Rippin' Riders. Since the PlayStation games had been published by Sony, the name needed to be changed, but it's still a very similar game overall in terms of style and structure. You get some different modes like free ride, super pipe, and head-to-head -head races, as well as a bunch of different courses and riders to choose from. You can concentrate on racing or master its many tricks, which there are dedicated portions of the track for. It's a lot sharper and better looking than the versions before it, though it does lack some of the personality of games like Steep Slope Sliders. It wasn't a particularly well-received game in its day, but I think it's more than playable and certainly worth the tenor it goes for regularly. Hell, grab a friend and it's worth that all day long. While crazy-ass stories are nothing new to Japanese-developed games, Sword of the Berserk here still stands out. This episode is far too short to explain it all, but allow me to sum up. A guy with a big sword shows up with a mentally ill girl and naked fairy. You find out that a disease is turning people into monsters, but not all is as it seems. You meet the bad guy, Baron Ballsack. Yes, Ballsack who first appears a friend, but you learn later is very much a foe. All sorts of exposition ensues, with the story getting crazier and crazier, and that's the game's biggest flaw. At its core, the gameplay is a hack and slash action game, but there is so much story that it just drowns the pacing and leaves you desperate to press start to get past it. You'll have a ton of fun cutting enemies down and raging out with your abilities, but man oh man does this game have too much story. Give it a try though, I think most of you will appreciate it. You guys remember Argonaut Software? They were the company that did Star Fox on the Super Nintendo and Croc on the Saturn. They showed up on the Dreamcast in 2000 with a free roaming shooter called Red Dog Superior Firepower. You are in control of an assault vehicle that must rid the Earth of the vile organization known as Hawk. You are outfitted with an advanced armor and weapon system that you can use at will to destroy other tanks, gun placements, and airships as you assault each enemy base. Each area is typically a series of above and below ground segments, each with different mission types such as seek and destroy and escort. There are a ton of multiplayer modes for up to four players as well. The gameplay here is actually quite responsive and fun once you learn how to power up your weapons and defend yourself. The engine runs incredibly well too, and never really seems to waver. There's a good variety in locations, and there is even a challenge mode to practice your vehicular manslaughter. It's simple, but the gameplay here does offer some fun, especially its robust multiplayer modes. In 1999, a small French developer named No Cliché released Toy Commander, a vehicle-based action title. Andy has a new set of toys and stopped playing with the old ones. They aren't taking it lying down though, and have decided to wage war. This one has you doing various missions all over the house. Sometimes it's simple tasks like boiling eggs, and other times it's escort missions through enemy territory. You even get some all-out war stages. It carries with it the instant appeal of playing with your toys during childhood. Using areas in your home for bases and doing battle with planes and tanks is something many of us remember fondly. There is great variety in the vehicles and missions, and I love how they use different areas of the house for everything. Sometimes they even take things to the extreme, like flooding the kitchen for a submarine mission. The gameplay is a bit loose and funky, 
and deaths come cheap and easy sometimes, but this still has a ton of appeal. It even has four-player head-to-head action. The same developer did a follow-up called Toy Racer the following year, which is exclusive to the Dreamcast as well. Exclusive games during a console's life are one of the major reasons you own them. There's something special about a game that is tied to the life of your favorite hardware and can't be gotten anywhere else. While a few of these games did receive PC releases, you can't play them on any other console. That means either trying to get an obscure 20-year-old PC game to run on Windows 10, firing up your Dreamcast, or seeing if emulation is good enough to play them. Most of these are strong enough to be worth your time and effort, and I can confirm that ReDream emulates many of them without a lot of issues. There are, of course, many more Dreamcast games that remain exclusive, so if this episode proves popular, we'll look at even more in a part two. I'm SigaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.